Welcome back, everyone, to another exciting episode of Full oh, 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 Circle. I, I know, I, I, I can't be on suspense there. I'm your host, as always, Oda Harmon Jr. You can find me at Oda Harmon Jr. on all your favorite social medias. And I'm Jared Burnett. You can find me at Toon Velo. If you notice this episode, I'm looking at the camera because Ooh. several people complained I didn't last episode. Gross. Right, so last episode, of course, was our San Diego Comic-Con live edition. Uh, we covered lots of great things. We talked about a lot of the things we did. But now, coming out on the Game Fanatics website, slowly but surely, probably one or two a day even, are all the interviews Odell did and all the fan experiences I got to do. Yeah, so if you don't get enough of, uh, if you don't get enough of us in full circle, you can find us at Game Fanatics doing other fun, cool stuff, interviewing some of your favorite celebrities and actors from some of your favorite shows. Right. And re- finger pointing. Pointing. <laughs> <laughs> and remember, the Game Fanatics is, of course, our parent site. So check out all of their things. Supporting them supports us. Ding! So, our topics for this week, Odell. We will be interviewing the creator of Gravity Ghost, and she is the senior quest designer at Gorilla Games, Erin Robinson Swink. Ooh, we looking forward to that. We'll also be talking about the Joy-Con Drift issue. What's Joy-Con Drift? Well... Jared's been having this issue with a pro controller, but we'll get into that. First and at the top of the hour, we'll be talking about geek jargon. Woo! Woo. It's back, people. So as you know, we're going to give you five internet culture topics. Well, not topics, words. And we'll define what they are and how you're supposed to use them properly. Up first, number one, ghosting. Ghosting. So what is ghosting? No, it is not Casper, the friendly ghost. The mattress, right? Oh, I got one of Casper mattress. <laughs> what? Damn, my mattress. This segment brought to you by Casper mattresses. And he goes that they were just like, oh, my back is there. <laughs> it just uh, pictures of me tossing. Right. Just, oh, man. Anyway. Yeah. You know, it is not your paranormal activity you think you're having. Yes, yes, I said it. I don't think your paranormal activity is real. Da, 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 don't da, add da. Me. Da, 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 da. Oh, this is just turning into a yeah. whole thing. All right, before we get to that, ghosty. It's when you know when there's fine. something weird in your news in your uh, DMs now. Who are you gonna call? Not this person. <laughs> <laughs> They're gone. They ghosted you. The All definition. Right. So as Jared just explained in a nice little ditty, as I'll call that. Thank you. <laughs> Go see this win. Wait, I have another one. As oh, okay. time right. goes by, it's the opposite of the movie Ghost. You're, you're, you won't have a phantom making pottery with <laughs> you're you. You're just making pottery by yourself. Yes. There's, is Whoopi Goldberg there at least? Yes, she's somehow still there. <laughs> so you know when you have that nice lady or lucky fella that you're really into, and you're talking, and you're hitting it off, and then one day. Things are just off and they never hit you back. Poof, sunk. Yeah, you've been ghosted. The textbook definition, a.k.a. Urban Dictionary, is when a person cuts off all communication with their friends or the person they're dating with zero warning or notice beforehand, you mostly see them avoiding friends, phone calls, social media, and avoiding them in public. I haven't seen Tom in three months. I think he may be ghosting me. Have you ever ghosted somebody? I'm sure I have. Oh, I know I have. I'll, <laughs> I'll admit to it. Right, because we, we, I feel we've all had these interactions on social media where someone tries to, t- you know, you're like in forums, people try and talk to you, and you go, sure, I'll entertain this. And they go, and it goes, the conversation goes like this, Odell. You're, you're a normal, sane person. So, but I start the conversation. All right. Hey. What's up? Hey. How are you? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I don't engage in non-versations, a non-conversation. At that point, Jerry, I feel like that doesn't count as It doesn't like, count as ghosting? No, because I feel like ghosting, like, either you have to have, like, some type of... Rapport? Sta- yeah, like, that That was like, can you can't even say you got ghosted? Y'all never had a conversation. But this is like someone, like, you probably hung out with, you know, you talk to text every day. You okay. Because I feel like, oh, you went on one horrible date, and, you're, and y'all are just like... Doesn't hey. count as ghosting. Counts as rejection. Yeah. Learn to take no as an answer. Yeah, see, that, that that's what I'm saying. Like, those are more just like, you stopped it before it started. I feel like ghosting, like, there was something. Okay. It, ghosting is like, okay, that kid showed up to the first first day of class and never again. That's not ghosting. That kid disappeared halfway through the semester. Ghosting. No, this is not a simple ghosting. I'm just using an analogy, people. 
you know, again, you know, they, they have to build up like, where's that kid? Who knows? So I feel like a person in the in your life for ghosting has to be like, where's that person? Right. Okay. So carrying on and with our theme of ghosting, dead. Oh, oh, very nice, very nice. Thank you. So dead is you know when people do they do it all the time in emojis, laughing, laughing, laughing. Skull, skull. and bowl, skull and bowl, skull and bones. Or it's just like, can you believe Jared was cheating on Tammy with Tiffany? Maybe just got them confused. That's close. <laughs> you know, dead. Dead. So what does that mean? Does that mean you were deceased and no longer with us? No. It means I'm dead is... Oops. <laughs> I was about to read the actual definition of dead. Nope. Not that one. It is you died of laughter or something shocked you to where you are now deceased. <laughs> that is funny that you laughed so hard that you died. You, you were shocked so hard that you are now dead. You did it, Eddie. You're killing them. You're slaying them. You're knocking them dead. Ah, Creep frame, dry rabbit. Yeah, there you go. So yes, when people be like, "I'm dead," one, they're not literally texting you that they are now deceased. They you know attend their funeral. That'd be a different kind of ghosting. <laughs> <laughs> Man, we're, we're going real full circle. We're going like circception. Ah. Yes, yeah, you know, I'm dead. It's just a way to express what the, I am feeling. Such a high of an emotion. It has now made me figuratively. I've left my body. Yes, not literally deceased. Hyperbole hyperbole okay although if you were to transcend your body and come back and brag about it that would be a weird flex but, but okay. okay so weird flex so before flex. we get to weird flex flex not the act of actually flexing your muscles means it's it's, it's a brag it's yeah. a, either way it's a brag yeah you know sometimes it's a humble brag is is you know i think it's more correct term where you know like you're bragging about something but you actually deserve to from a from community. Oh, that was a comp assault. Half com, compliment, half insult. And that was an explain a brag. Half a <laughs> explanation, <laughs> half brag. I made it up. All right. So now so now we know what flex means. It's just a brag or boast, either humbly or just you know playing out. I guess just in everyone's face. A weird flex. But okay, just if you replace you know the word flex with brag, just it's something that you can brag about. You can be proud, but it's a little weird. So Why? the definition is. To flex, which means to brag or boast or show off something. The phrase weird flex, but okay, is said when someone proudly boasts or brags about something that most people would either find awkward, irrelevant, or just plain weird. For example, for me to go out into a group of people that I don't know and be like, you know, I completed every Pokédex imaginable since the originals against people who, A, don't play Pokémon or even video games, really, and it's like a corporate meeting. No, no, that's not that's not a weird flex. Weird flex is like completely like, okay, so you're bragging about something that is like undesirable. Like, ha, huh, bet you haven't been rejected by as many women as I have. That's a weird flex, but okay. okay. That example is five times better. Or like, <laughs> hey, I was born with two extra pairs of toes. No, that's just weird. That's that, like, that, that, I mean, you're bragging. That's still a weird flex. It's like, yeah. But, like, I, but you don't have like the cockiness of like, a brag. I have webbed feet that makes me a better swimmer. Weird flex, but okay. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. All right. Next one, we don't have a snazzy transition I, I, to. I, I, bet. <laughs> I, was, I was about to say, I was like, Jared, I, I, you, you've been doing so well. Sorry. So, okay, wait. It's like, and you're just going to launch in the next one without me having to explain it. Bet. bet. So... Actually, this confuses a lot of people, and I don't know I why. Confused. Well, I, I feel like people use it regularly now. Like, it's kind of always been used, but, like, like its usage is ramped up in okay, recent years. I, I wasn't confused. It was just presented to me suddenly and without warning, and I was like... But you still knew what it meant with the context clue. It's true. It's true. Okay. So, when someone says bet, I mean, usually they mean, like, hey, let's make a bet. But if someone says bet just, like, on its own accord as a single word to your response... It usually means, yeah, I agree, okay, that's cool, let's do it, etc. So if Jared was like, hey, you want to get lunch after the show? And I was like, bet. We're getting lunch. Yeah, we're getting lunch. So, it's very simple. It is slang for, for show, which is slang for, for sure, which is slang <laughs> for, sure, or okay. <laughs> like, and okay are initials for the word, okay, a, y. <laughs> 
I really enjoyed how this broke it down. It's really great. I, you know, I'm just going to repeat it because it was fun to say. Bet, it is slang for for show, which is slang for for sure, which means sure or okay. Nice. <laughs> nice. And then the last one. All right. This this is all, whatever you call the, the teeny boppers under millennials. I, I do not Gen, like this word. Gen Zers? What, whatever. I've heard, I've heard Zoomers. Zoomers. Like Boomers, but Gen Z, but Zoomers. Okay, no, we're not getting into that. I hate your generation. <laughs> <laughs> no. Because we get blamed for all their crap. I mean, that's fair, but we don't hate them for it. We got to protect them. I mean, I, I don't, I, I figuratively hate them. The, I Shakespearean hate them. Okay. <laughs> Romantically hate them? You know, I'm going to start telling people that I Shakespearean hate them. I don't really hate New them. word, our fifth word is rom- Shakespearean hate. Yeah. So no. it, it is yeet, popularized by, you know, those little yeet. R- rainbow skittle looking rappers. Yeet! And you, you whatever you 12 to 17 year olds are. So yeet is a versal meaning. You can mean it to be excited, like, hey man, we're going to get so drunk tonight, yeet. It can be mean the action of throwing something. That's, That's how weird. I use it. Can we get another example? Going to yeet you to the sun? Yeet! Or it, or it can be used to exclaim victory. Like, our team won. Yeet. Yeet. So, Yeet. here's the Yeet. Urban Dictionary definition, which I will now enjoy. Yeet is a versatile word that can be used as exclamation, a verb, or even a noun. Exclamation, it can be used to express excitement, usually happily, but also nervously. It can be used to explain victory. Yeah. And then it gives some examples but I read example three. Okay. It's my favorite. Okay. A group of brave Mexican vigilantes are rescuing children and their families from gang violence in the South by leading them across the U.S. border. But alas, a wretched wall stands in their way. If only one of the brave leaders had the strength to break through it. Suddenly, one of them backs up, steps on his foot back, holds their fist straight in the air, and charges the wall like a bolt of lightning. Badass Mexican going, Eat! That was an elaborate <laughs> example that I was not prepared for. Yeet. <laughs> Yeet. So, yeeting is fun as all and all, unless it's your joystick s- slowly listing to the left, Le- leading to the left, yeet lifting to the left. That's my transition. So, the Nintendo <laughs> Joy-Cons have, for everybody's kind of experienced it, started drifting in one direction or another. Um, specifically the left one, right? The, yeah, specifically the main, main? The main yeah, Joy-Con. You, yeah, you move movement one, and this one's more like camera-y with your right hand. Presumably. Is that sh- all, that's usually what it is, right? The yeah. right thumbstick is like camera movement. Or, or sudden smash. <laughs> sudden charge smash. Presumably it would occur in both, though, but it has, Nintendo has the issue of the Switch Joy-Con wearing out, which is super disappointing. And so previously people have sent it in and you can pay for it, but now Nintendo has quietly- Started doing it for free. Started doing it for free. Like you do it and they'll do it. They, like, uh, I think it was Vice and IGN and Otaku have all reported on, I think it was Vice that got the internal memo that's like, yeah, we're just gonna start fixing them now. But yeah. it, but Nintendo themselves is not like, you know, you've not started your Switch and it goes, hey, class action lawsuit has declared yeah i was gonna say that that is amazing someone actually filed a class action lawsuit the problem is that big it's built up so much you know one i haven't had that problem but that's probably because i always play my switch in handheld mode i mean docked i play my switch docked like 89 percent of the time so maybe i just haven't had time for my joy cons to get worn out completely but i feel like maybe i just gotta get joy cons I don't know, but they're coming out with new series of Joy-Cons. I'm pretty sure those will be fine, and the Switch Lite will be fine. Well, that's a lot of people's concern, because are will they be fine, or is it the same hardware, same manufacturer, right? Because, again, so this is my complaint, right, against Macs and Apples. You know, it's just like, oh, it's so great. You just send it away for, like, two weeks. I can't use it for two weeks, and then they send it back to me. But what happens when it's part of the Switch Lite and it's permanently fixed? Hey, I'm going on a vacation. i got to send this away. Well, I don't get it for vac- you know you just yeah. you can't play at all like okay. at least with the normal switch you can just snap in something else real quick. Okay, well one I'm just gonna assume that like part of the issue probably is like I feel like they're made differently because one they have different components in them just right off the back. 
to and I, they're part of the internal system and not their own separate beast. So I I I personally feel like that won't be an issue. I I express my doubts. This is my doubts. I I I can comfortably say because I mean it's the same. Okay, like I pointed, I uh, visibly said my jo- my pro controller is doing it too. It forever likes to go down. And it's super, super inconvenient. Now, while I don't know if the class action lawsuit covers the pro controller, oh, like we should also say you can do this even without, even if it's not under warranty, because I think all controllers are good for a year. Um, but doesn't matter. Just send it in anyway. Now. Are you gonna try sending your pro controller? I'm going to try and send in my pro controller because it's super, super annoying. Um, I've posted videos. Maybe I'll send, I, download it from Twitter, where it's like the calibration is just like. Yeah, push down. I'm like, it's already down. Now release. I'm not holding it. And it's just like chugging along down here on the radar. You know, I feel like that might be your pro controller for going on two ham and smash. But I'm also rooting for you that they just give you a new one. They, Right? I'm just like, I, I don't know. Uh, I know I can be heavy handed, but. Okay, no. I'm pretty sure your, your pro controller is just worn down. But as. <laughs> as, as I, I do a lot of phantom and teleporting where it's just <laughs> literally this motion. So I, I was also going to say, but we also know that the Switch itself was secretly upgraded. Like, if you bought, like, the Switches being sold now have way more memory. It's and, true. you know, XYZ, XYZ. So I'm assuming if the Switches being sold now are already better than the Switches we bought at launch, then I'm, I'm all but sure the light. Right. And, and, and if Nintendo thought there was a problem, I feel like they're smart enough to be like, this thing doesn't ship until when September. Yeah, September. It or no something or so November. I feel late, like late fall. I feel like they're smart enough to be like, do not sell those, do not sell those, sell these. They Probably. they have the resources and money to do such a thing. Right. Like again. It, so that's why I'm also feel. Let's just say there is a problem with the light. Nintendo is not going to be slandered twice. I feel like that's like their whole mantra. Hopefully, knock on wood. Yeah. But I'm saying, but my thing is, if the if there's already a Switch out that was secretly upgraded, I would assume the Switch Lite would also be upgraded to the levels that the other Switches, that like, I mean, that's essentially people buying the Switch now are just getting a better product than we paid for. Fair enough, which, good for them. Uh, and I guess I shouldn't, maybe this is something, because I don't think Nintendo's acting maliciously here, but perhaps, you know, this is their first console hybrid handheld so perhaps they didn't anticipate this level of wear and tear. Maybe. Um, mm. And also, I mean, this is just speculation. I guess I'm, I am just being the uh, the anti point to your concerns here for the sake of, I guess, conversation. God's advocate. If I'm being <laughs> devil's advocate. <laughs> um. They already said the Switch Lite was already made, you know, with to be a handheld and handheld in mind. And also, I, when I hear that, I always think kid proof. <laughs> so that's another reason why I rubber think, rubber bumpers, uh, chunky. I don't know. Yeah. So I already thought like I'm pretty. I am pretty positive that you know. The Switch Lite on a performance level will probably perform better than the Switch when you compare the the both the two both in the handheld mode. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Of course, the Switch Pro is going to come out next year, and we'll just all be happy, and it'll be amazing. At least it better. Yes. Ugh. Or you're going to have another case action lawsuit, Nintendo. Unless I work for you, you don't have to worry about it. Then you just get all your controllers and Switches for free. Okay, but speaking of games, now we have a special treat. We interviewed, by we, I mean Odell, interviewed um, Aaron Robinson Swink. Uh, like I said before, the senior quest designer at Guerrilla Games and creator of the indie game Gravity Ghost. Uh, so here we have their interview um, for you to listen to and see all the great uh, gameplay and such. All right. We'll let Miss Aaron take it away. How are you doing today? I'm pretty good. Yeah, it's uh, I live in Amsterdam, so it's about uh, it's the evening here. Just got home from work. So, yeah, a little bit, a little bit sleepy, but otherwise pretty good. <laughs> Well, thank you for joining us from the Netherlands, from across the globe. But, you know, gaming is a global activity and we don't stop. 
So can you tell the people a little bit more about yourself, you know, how you got into games, how it all got started, as you know, as a person of color and a woman, you know, our uh, field of expertise in the game world is something often overshadowed, and a lot of people feel like, you know, they can't do it because they don't see enough of us doing it. So could you tell me a little bit about your story and maybe, you know, encourage some other people to follow their dreams? Sure, yeah, I hope it will be encouraging. Um, I didn't study computer science. I don't come from <laughs> that kind of background. Um, I studied psychology, uh, and I basically I, I started making games as a hobby uh, in 2005 when I was uh, in my college dorm room. I was, I think, procrastinating from exams. It's been a long time. I think that's what I was probably <laughs> doing, though. Um, I had a good friend, and we both loved old-school adventure games like uh, King's Quest, uh, and she really liked the Monkey Island games, which I hadn't seen before, so she showed me those. Um, and then she showed me that people were still making these games as, a, as like a hobby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, specifically, there was a free game engine called Adventure Game Studio, and um, she showed me like a game that had been made in that, and it was um, it was by the... Do you know Yahtzee? He makes videos now, but he used to just make adventure games and sort of write articles and stuff. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he does zero punctuation, but he also makes adventure games, so I played his game... Uh, Five Days a Stranger, and I really loved it. It was like kind of weird and creepy, but also um, it felt like something new. So I thought, well, shoot, I could do this. Um, <laughs> if Yahtzee can do it, I can do it. <laughs> it's more like it had really like pixel art. You know, it wasn't very high tech or anything, but the story was really compelling, and the interactions were very interesting, and there a lot of, a lot of um, imagination had gone into it, uh, and I just really loved that. So I I downloaded the program a couple of days later, I think, and just started uh, clicking on stuff. Uh, and really what helped me was joining up with an internet forum of people who were also developing things with the game engine. Um, so that's really where I got my start was, uh, I started posting some art that I made in Microsoft Paint and I said, Hey, does anybody want to help me work on this? It's about this ghost girl. You know, there's a theme in my work. This, my current game is also about a ghost girl. So, you know, it shows up again and again. Um, but yeah, people wanted to help me. So I, I, I teamed up with a programmer and a musician and we make that game in about, uh, about uh, eight months, uh, which felt like a long time at the time, but now it just seems like a miracle to me. <laughs> um, and it's about a little ghost girl at a carnival in the land of the dead, and she wins a live goldfish uh, as a prize in a game of darts, and she has to rescue it, and that's what the game is about. <laughs> oh, so I like that you just figured I'm going to do it. I'm just going to dive in, figure it out, and... And I'll, find the de I'll figure out the details later was my attitude about it. Um, and then it wasn't until several years later... Um, it wasn't until, yeah, 2010 that I decided, you know what, I'm going to learn how to code because it will make me a better designer. Uh, and that was really my, my motivation for starting. And I was lucky enough to have some good friends in, in the area who, who knew how to code. Um, and I would basically come to them and say, hey, I, I want to try to make this. Can you show me how that would work? And we'd sort of break it down into tiny little pieces like, oh, well, here's my, how you might make a timer and here's how you might do this. Um, and it was really through their help and through like YouTube and stuff that I was able to get up to speed, if you can believe that. <laughs> I I mean I can you can learn how to basically build a car if you wanted to on YouTube. <laughs> These days, um, certainly back when I started game development, there wasn't there weren't a lot of like video resources. You know, it was all like people, and I don't know, maybe that's less social now. But um, yeah, certainly I I didn't possess any special education uh, for this to be able to get started. Um, so hopefully uh, that's a encouraging thing to hear. <laughs> Oh, no, I feel it. you know, a lot of people in today's era are like, well, I didn't go to school. I didn't have formal training. And, you know, that that is a viable reason. But, you know, people use it as like a setback as a as a as a socially acceptable excuse why I didn't pursue a certain area. So I think it's great to hear someone be like, well, I didn't have any of that. But, you know, the can do attitude and just the ability to willing to tinker, essentially. Yeah. Yeah, basically. And I, you know, I wasn't always good at following instructions like. You know, I was told just pick something really simple, pick something that already exists, like asteroids, and try to see if you can make that. And I was like, no, I want to make my own thing. You know, I want to. <laughs> At the time, believe it or not, that's like when the seeds of gravity goes for being sown. I'm like, I want to, I want to make this gravity hopping planet game. And people are like, don't make that. It's so complicated and so hard. And I was like, making doubt, making like little prototypes. I'm like, but this is fun. There's something here that I really like. And they're like, this is going to be hard. And it, it was really hard. We spent uh, like. I probably spent like months or even years like tuning the gravity to, to feel just right. But I'm glad I stuck with it because I really like what came out of it. I guess I'm sort of stubborn in that way. Oh, no, most definitely. Um, you know, not not a insult to your game at all. But when I was watching, I was getting Mario Galaxy vibes and I was just like, oh, man, you know, 
that's what made that game such a huge success you know the feel of the gravity and if you get that right i mean you put in what you get that's a very flattering comparison thank you i uh I <laughs> oh, you're that. welcome yeah, definitely. There were moments in Mario Galaxy where you sort of would jump and fall and then you'd do like a cool figure eight around two planets. And I was like, whoa, I want more of that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, most definitely. And um, so uh, what platforms is this coming out and when? And could you tell me more about the game? So it's coming out uh, for the PS4 uh, on August 6th in uh, for the Americas. Uh, and it's a game about a little ghost girl searching for her lost friend who is a ghost fox. And they're in outer space. Uh, and it's a very peaceful, chill game. Uh, basically, you, you jump and you use gravity of planets to get around. In each level, there's a little star you have to collect, and that'll open the door to let you get to the next level. Uh, and along the way, you sort of learn this backstory of, like, who who is this girl? Or, you know, since she's a ghost, like, who was this girl? And what happened uh, to bring us here? So it's sort of got this, this sort of um, weird, uh, sort of melancholy tinge with hope, tinge with silliness, sort of... Um, I don't know how you else I would explain it, but uh, we have a really cool soundtrack by Ben Prunty that suits it just perfectly. So, um, yeah, I find it still fun to play uh, after all these years. Oh, that's great. I mean, you have me at Ghost Fox. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, I personally, I mean, I grew up on platformers, and they're still my favorite genre. I believe uh, Yoshi's Island is probably to this day in my top three best games ever made. So any great platformer, I'm automatically a fan of, and like the great platformers of your, yours is very colorful, and I'm I'm really digging the art style. Did you uh? I know you talked about Microsoft Paint, but were you the artist on this, or did you reach out for help? I I did like ninety percent of the art that you see in the game, so thank you. I did uh, I did level up my skills over the years. I finally got Photoshop one day, and you know. <laughs> uh, but thank you. Uh, yeah, I tried to. Uh, when you're when you're in outer space, the colors are very vibrant. You have a lot of like deep purples and blues, uh, and the girl herself is very bright. I didn't want like a pale sort of ethereal fading away ghost. I wanted her to be really bright and really present. Uh, and then to contrast with that, when you're seeing the flashbacks of her life, the backgrounds are all black and white, and sort of only the people are in color. Um, and everybody else is sort of wearing like the primary colors, like red and yellow and blue. But she's wearing green because she doesn't quite fit in with everybody else. And so there's a lot of thought that went into sort of the, the colors that you see. Oh, that that's actually pretty cool. I'm I'm not gonna I will say this. I'm not an artist by treat. And because of that, I'm always just like, oh, colors look good. And then when I hear real artists be like, oh, she's green because clearly these colors don't match the same palette as the other colors. I'm just like, oh man, I'm so inept. I I need to like take <laughs> like an art class so I can appreciate these things. Yeah, one thing they always tell beginners when they're like, How do I how do I get good at stuff? You say you know, look at something that somebody who is advanced has made and then ask yourself, why did they do that? And why did they make those decisions? And like, people told me that when I was starting out and I totally ignored that because no, I just want to make my own thing, darn it. Like, but uh, it's really true. Like every single choice, every single design thing you see in a video game was a choice somebody made. And it's really useful to kind of go and see like, okay, well, why did they do it that way? You know, you know, why didn't they do it this other way that I've seen before? Um, does it something special for this game that we need to have that? I guess one example I could give you from Gravity Ghost is that I wanted this game to be really accessible to people who don't play video games, um, and I really had noticed over, you know, in my previous experience that, like, people who don't play games a lot, if you hand them a game and they play it and they die, they don't want to play anymore, you know, they, they just kind of, like, back away, um, and that's not the only reason for this, but in my game there's no killing and no dying, uh, it's, uh, it, 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 the very, very early demos had, like, lives and health and stuff, um, but it didn't really fit with this sort of chill flying around in space thing. I didn't want people to have to worry about spikes or razor blades or whatever. It's all kind of like awful if you think about it. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so then it, it sort of opens that door to say, you know what, you can you, you can explore this ho however you want to. Uh, and another thing I did to try to make it more accessible to a broader audience is that um, sort of like the idea of carrying inventory in a game and using inventory, like that can be pretty complicated actually. Uh, and so in my game, when you collect something, it actually just floats around behind you. Um, she collects animal spirits that hang out in her hair, her long hair, and you can get up to 14 of them at a time if you really want to. Um, you collect little pieces of a broken planet uh, and those will just float around you like little buddies. Uh, and you can have up to seven of those at the same time. In fact, there's a Chivo for getting both of those things, the seven planets and the 14 animals and it just says i may have overcommitted <laughs> so <laughs> we put in a we put in a trophy for that um and yeah just other stuff like that when when she gets a power up um 
Oh, there's two different kinds of power up in the game. There's sort of this terraforming mechanic where if a planet is like a solid Earth planet, she can run around it with her water trail and turn it into a water planet, and then she can dive inside if the star is inside the planet. Uh, and then there's other power-ups, which are the movement power-ups, where she can dash and uh, use like heavy mode and double jump and glide and, and things like that. So all those things are very visually represented uh, in the game, and really like there's not a lot in the menu except for like subtitles and audio stuff, because uh, I really wanted it all to be pretty obvious, um, and that that was you know the reason behind those choices. No, I completely get you know simplicity in games is not a bad design choice. I feel we moved into an era where people feel like. A game has to be, you know, Dark Souls levels of complicated to be considered good. Yeah, and I just think people, you know, have missed out that just because a game is ultra simplistic doesn't mean it can't be great. I mean, look at the Wii back when it first came out. It, it was it was literally minimal arm motions and, you know, the world ate it up because I just felt like people forgot about that. Yeah, that, that was... That was a fun time because uh, this is a fun memory because uh, it's a uh, it's about my grandmother who passed away about uh, five years ago. Um, but but when the Wii came out, one of my uncles bought her a Wii because he heard that it was really good for seniors, and she was just like, "Get that thing out of my house!" <laughs> He's like, "I heard it's good for seniors. They have bowling." She's like, "I don't want to have anything to do with that." But <laughs> but yeah, like that somebody you know like in this older generation would have been so interested in it. It was really a, a remarkable thing. And that just shows that there is this huge hunger for games, you know, no matter who you are. And I've read about, you know, in some places they're using even the Wii for doing like physical rehabilitation for folks who are getting their coordination back and stuff. Like having to draw your arm back and roll a bowling ball is way more interesting than just like raising it up and down. Right. So there's all sorts of cool things uh, that you can do. I don't know. I, I like to think that we can have sort of an imagination about what's possible. Um, and not take for granted the things that have always been in games before and sort of like, you know, riff on that a little bit, I guess. No, I agree with you 110% because if we don't have these entry games, these these wonderful worlds and ideas that, you know, that we already as seasoned gamers can enjoy, but people who maybe either are just, you know, starting off playing games as a young kid or maybe someone who's just missed out missed the train their whole life and they're like maybe i want to delve into it and you know like your game you know it looks appealing there's you know the visualness of the story the mechanics and you know it resonates with someone and all that's going to do is encourage them like man is there more like this and that would be really nice <laughs> yeah but i mean it's on the ps4 so i mean that's a good choice yeah i hope we sell a few dozen copies <laughs> <laughs> I do. I can use some new socks. It's not easy for indie games right now, but I could use some new pairs of socks, so I hope some people buy it. <laughs> oh, no, completely. Hey, you never know. The, the thing I always find interesting about the indie sphere is that, you know, even your game cannot take off for like a year or two, and then one random day, somebody's like, this game's cool, and then someone else's like, yeah, this game's cool, and it's like, it happens all the time. I'll play an indie game because people wouldn't stop talking about it, and I found out it came out like two years prior, and I'm just like, what? Oh, that's super encouraging. Thank you. I've I've heard stories from friends in the industry who like, you know, n nobody was paying attention to our game, and then this really famous Twitch streamer found it, and now we're doing great. <laughs> like, yeah, I mean, that's that's just the nature of the beast. <laughs> yeah, I I kind of put it akin to like when a song becomes popular on the on, you know the top one hundred Billboard charts, and you find out the artist like sang the song two years prior, and they don't even have any reason why it just happened no explanation sometimes just lightning does strike i guess um and you, you never know and then you know it gets popular then you get to remake the hd remastered remix edition with the complete <laughs> extra bonus levels and then you're getting <laughs> you're getting all the socks sorry it, it is possible to get sort of like like locked into your own success almost like my friends in toronto who made the game n and then n plus and then n plus plus you know it just kept selling so well i kind of had to keep you know remaking it for different platforms and like that's what I would call a champagne problem, right? But it's like they did want to make other things. They did try to make other things, but none of them really sold as well as that. So it's like kind of a kind of an interesting thing, success. You know, it doesn't always quite shake out the way people, I guess, want it to or expect it to. Um, I've also heard the term success disaster <laughs> thrown around where, like, you know, the game gets, like, too much interest and then they don't have the, like, you know, number of people at the company who can, like, deal with that. It's really interesting. I mean... If you're primarily like two people working on a game, which is what we were, you know, like, it, yeah, there's only so much bandwidth you have. 
That is true. But hey, I mean, it's on the PS4. I feel that is a big win for you because I know, you know, I, I've been in the industry for a while and I know a lot of indie games that never leave the testing site. I go to PAX a lot every year, you know, and I, and I see some of the games. I'm not, you know, not calling them out, but it'll be like, hey, you know, we're coming soon. And then four years later, I see them at PAX. I'm just like, what? what's going on here? <laughs> God, I, I heard a quote recently, and I won't say who said it in case she doesn't want this like known, but she said, game development is either glitter or doom. <laughs> <laughs> and it's really true. It's like when stuff goes well, it's really amazing. And because of the magic of like scalability, you know, something that's a piece of software can sell an infinite number of copies, right? We don't have to make discs anymore. Um, but there's the flip side of that, which is that you could also sell zero copies if people aren't interested. And what people are interested in is always changing and you know, people chase the trends, but at the time the game comes out, usually, you know, trends have blown by. It's just, uh, it's such an interesting industry to be a part of. Like, I do really enjoy it, and I don't know, it's different every day, and it's different every year. So, yeah, it's something I've really enjoyed being a part of. The glitter part, not the doom. Yeah. I mean, out of, you know, the millions of emails I receive every day, it's not millions, but I just want to make myself sound nice. (laughs) But, you know, out of the emails, I did see this one, and I was like, I was talking to, you know, my podcast uh, partner. I was like, hey, what do you think about this? This looks cool, right? And he's like, yeah, that looks cool. Want to talk about this? Yeah, we're going to talk about this. All right. Well, I guess I've heard your story. I heard about Gravity Ghost, but I guess I just want to hear about your ambition. What are you hoping people get out of this? What is what is the, you know, like you said, everything that a developer does is intentional. So what was the feeling you were trying to convey to the player. Because, you know, I love hearing about that. Because, you know, especially when I play this game, I'll be having all this, you know, insider information. And so will you two listeners of Full Circle Podcast. <laughs> well, um, I wanted to try to tell a story about one family. And, you know, I think a lot of a lot of modern media, you know, sort of invokes saving the world, saving the universe as, like, sort of the stakes of what makes it uh, important that you're doing these things in the game. And there's definitely like, I totally love that stuff. And there's absolutely like, it does make for really exciting, like entertainment. But I just, I guess for myself, I wanted to set this challenge of like, can I tell a story about one family and have that be compelling enough to sort of sustain a whole game. And it's sort of like, it's a bit based on my own experiences being part of a big family uh, and also growing up in Canada, sort of there in this cold, isolated place. Um, the main character, this is not really a spoiler, she's the daughter of some lighthouse keepers, uh, and historically they, they were very isolated, you know, they even had to grow their own food, uh, and sometimes, you know, kids would have to take a rowboat to school, and those are things that sort of um, show up in the game, actually. There's a, they have a garden that you see that becomes an important plot point, uh, and, you know, something happens where the kids can't go to school anymore, and, uh, you know, these, these things come through it, and it's just sort of based on my own sort of geekiness about, like, history and wanting to tell stories, um, there's a character who's in it. His name is Arthur. Uh, he's sort of um, the main character's uh, big sister. She has a love interest, and he's a love interest. And he's uh, an African American merchant marine. Uh, and you see him in his like dress uniform at one point. And I put that in because they were a group of of you know people who served in, especially in the Second World War, who who suffered the highest casualties of almost any group. And and it's a part of the it's like a division of of armed forces that almost nobody has heard of. They were doing a lot of shipping. Right and things like that. So these, these are like quiet stories I tried to seed in here, um, in sort of a, a subtle way. But mainly, yeah, it's about uh, it's about the main character and her relationship to her older sister. <laughs> Man, I, I, I after hearing all that, I almost feel I feel. I guess bad. Cause I'm just like this game looks pretty, and then I hear all that, and I'm just like, oh man, I'm I am so basic. Those <laughs> in here, you know, I won't. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I like it when people tell me they've played the game because when they start out, they're like, this is cute, but I get the sense that something really awful happened. And I was like, yes, keep playing. <laughs> um, usually if somebody says, you know, hey, I played your game, uh, I can tell if they played to the end or not. Because <laughs> if, if they haven't played to the end, they're like, oh, it's so cute. I love the, the way it feels and I love the, you know, flying around. <laughs> and if they played to the end, they kind of get a faraway look like I played your game. <laughs> oh, no, I complete is is. I get that. It's like when you, you play like a really good game, and, you know, you talk to people like, oh, have you played so-and-so? And you're like, yeah. And you hear them talking about it, and they're like, it's so happy-go-lucky. And you're thinking, you've never made it even halfway. <laughs> the stuff. Um, yeah, definitely wanted there to be sort of a, uh, 
you know, it's interesting. I, I mentioned my, my background is in psychology, and I tried to think about different ways I could make this game interesting to people, right? Sort of these different hooks. Uh, and the hooks can come from, you know, the gameplay being interesting and the levels becoming increasingly challenging in the right pace. You know, there's these are hooks too. But also with the story, I, I didn't want to come out and say, here's what this game is about. And one thing I learned in, in psych class was that people are really good at making a whole picture when they only have incomplete information. We're, we're so, so good at that, and that's interesting to us. And I thought, well, you know, what if I just told the story in like 14 really random flashbacks from her life? Because they're not in chronological order, and technically in the game you can find them in any order, um, but people are able to sort of piece it together from that. And I wanted it to be something that's interesting enough that people are sort of chewing on it while they're flying around in the space levels. Like, well, well then what, what led to this, and how did that happen, you know? And I don't know, I, I, I've heard that the people really like it, so I, I feel good about that. Oh, no, um, as this conversation has gone on, I've just gotten more and more interested. And I'm glad your background is in psychology because I don't have a psychology degree, but I've always told people that video games is the ultimate form of storytelling. Since it's not passive, it's interactive. You know, you know, I can watch someone's life story unfold on a movie screen and, you know, feel many things. But when I play through someone's life story, it, it's just a whole nother vibe. Man, well, I really hope you like this game then, because you definitely, it gets real. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I will. Well, for all y'all listening, this has been Aaron Robinson Swink. I thank you for joining me. Gravity Ghost Deluxe Edition coming out in North America, August 6, 2019. Hopefully the rest of the world will get to play this gym, but only time will tell. <laughs> thank you very much. All right, well, you have a great day, and thank you for joining us, and we can't wait to play the game. Awesome. Yeah, I hope you like it if you play it. All right, everybody, that was Erin Swink talking about her latest game, Gravity Ghost Deluxe Edition for the PS4. So check it out. Support the show. I don't know. Enjoy the game. It looks cool. I like things that are colorful. Art style looks nice. Mm -hmm. That's like 80% of what I need in an indie game. Right. Okay, so, at least 50. Yeah. I'm like, hey, gameplay, gameplay still matters. It's so still, it's like, right. <laughs> that's still... On the flip side, then you have Undertale, where aesthetic is like zero and, well, the, the, the it, story it has its own aesthetic, right? But, yeah, yeah it's, it's story-driven. Point, Point is, being... Support indie shows. Ding! Support indie games. Ding! Support us. Like, share, subscribe to Full Circle Podcast. Remember, we can't make it big unless you make it happen. Oh, that was so smart. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, nice. Well, as always, wrapping up another show, I'm Odell Harmon Jr. You can find me at Odell Harmon Jr. And I'm Jared Fritt. You can find me at Tomb Velo. Follow the podcast at FC Podcast 23. And again, check out our Comic-Con videos coming out on the Game Fanatics channel. That'll be fun. I mean, at least, at least like six are up right now. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And like six more are coming. All right. Have a good week, everybody.